You're listening to The Dead Prussian, a podcast about war and warfare. Whether you're an American Caesar, or maybe just a bloke that wants to nuke China, chances are people are going to know who you are. You might have been Australia's saviour, or you could have been the North Korean's bane. We're going to talk about a polarising figure that may or may not have been the most famous general of World War II. He might have even come close to being a post-World War II president, but unfortunately he got a little trigger happy. Well, that's what the rumour goes. Luckily, we're not going to talk about any of the controversies from that part of his career. Who am I talking about? Well, you'll find out in a minute, listeners. G'day, listeners, and thanks very much for tuning in to The Dead Prussian in 2018. We've had a couple of episodes down now, and it's good to see a lot of support coming our way. Why? Because I like being supported. Talking about support, because you brought it up, we do have the Patreon membership scheme now going. So if you want to be a member of the TDP community, please check out uh, patreon.com backslash the dead Prussian. You can jump on and get a whole heap of benefits as a legend, legend plus, legend double plus, or legend triple plus. And once we hit our first fundraising goal, we will start releasing the the manuscripts, not manuscripts, I'm not that good a writer, the transcripts from all of our interview episodes. But let's get talking about our topic today. And I think you would have guessed who our topic is. And if you haven't guessed, well, I'm not going to spoil it for you just yet. But my guest today is someone who's been on the show before. It is Dr. Peter Dean. He's Professor of War Studies and Pro Vice Chancellor of Education at the University of Western Australia where he is also a senior fellow at the Perth US Asia Centre. Peter was formerly Associate Dean of Education for ANU's College of Asia and the Pacific in 2015-2016 and a senior fellow in the Strategic and Defence Studies Centre and the Australian Command and Staff College, where he had the pleasure of instructing some very good podcast hosts. He is an Endeavour Research Fellow and in 2014 was a Fulbright Scholar in the Australian United States Alliance Studies His major research and teaching interests are in Australian strategic policy, the ANZUS Alliance, if you don't know what that is, look it up, it's not about biscuits, military operations and defence studies. Peter is the author and editor of seven books, that's right, seven books, this guy publishes more than Lawrence Friedman. He has uh, written the Australian-American Alliance, uh, that's with Melbourne University Press in 2016, Australia's Defence, A New Era, Melbourne University Press 2014. The Architect of Victory, which we talked about in episode 22 from Cambridge University Press, and that was published in 2011. He's also written Australian 1942 from Cambridge University Press, Australian 1943 from Cambridge University Press 2014, and Australian 1944 to 45, and that was Cambridge University Press in 2015. All three of those books you can find on our bookshelf once I update it, and they were very handy for myself when I had to write an essay on the Southwest Pacific. He has taught courses on military operations and expeditionary warfare and on Australian strategic alliances. And he is a senior fellow of the Higher Education Academy and in 2011 was a recipient of a citation for outstanding contributions to student learning in the Australian Learning and Teaching Council's Australian Awards for University Teaching. And most importantly though, listeners, he is here for our chat today on his latest book, And it's going to be released uh, this March, and you'll find it, uh, we'll put a link in the show notes and uh, direct you to Book Depository, where you get free global shipping, and that's free global shipping to anywhere in the world on the globe. Uh, And this book is MacArthur's Coalition, United States and Australian Operations in the Southwest Pacific. It's published by University Press of Kansas, and it's coming out this year. Peter, thanks for appearing on the show. Thank you so much. Thank you for the, for the long and exhaustive bio. I'm sure most of your readers are probably turned off by now. Listeners. That's all right. Um, because we had that big lunch, I needed to give a fair bit of uh, wind out. So uh, it's better to go out my mouth than anything else when the microphones are on. Um, my listeners did get a little bit on your background from the bio, but also yep. in episode 22, uh, we discussed uh, the architect of victory, um, Frank... Berryman, uh, who was known as uh, the Bastard, was it Bastard? Barry the Bastard, Barry yes. the Bastard, that's it. So we will uh, we'll skip everything uh, that they would have heard then. If some of our listeners didn't, though, maybe you can give us a little bit of background as to how or why you became a historian and why the Second World War is of particular interest to yourself. So uh, how's pretty simple. History is the only thing I was ever good at. 
Um, you know, when I was at school, um, it's the only thing I really seemed to enjoy when I went to school. I kind of ended up at university by accident, so I thought I might as well <laughs> do a history degree um, on US history and US politics. And then from there, from a, a strange quirk of things, I ended up as a school teacher for a few years. Mm. Um, although that was sort of only as an attempt as an alternative way of getting some money while I was going to do my PhD, which I eventually got around to doing in, uh, in military history. The Second World War, well, it's, a, it's the good war, as they say. <laughs> but most importantly, what I, I particularly like about the Second World War is it's global in, in nature and it's very joint in the way it operates. And you see all the modern elements of war there. Mm -hmm. You're talking about strategic bombing, you're talking about amphibious operations, you're talking about you know, manoeuvre at, at, at the deep battle level at Blitzkrieg and all these types of elements. So where, you know, World War, the World War One Mafia, and there's so many of them around, talk about oh, sitting, in, sitting in trenches, you know. They're everywhere. And they get all excited about the last sort of six months of the year when people start moving around a bit on the Western Front. Yeah. But uh, once that sort of uh, concept of combined arms operations and everything matures, that's what got me really interested in the in the Second World War. And, of course, as, as a bit of an Australianist, it's, it's a war that touches our shores physically yep. as well. And, and we actually play a, a significant role, particularly in the Pacific War. It's interesting you mentioned the uh, World War One Mafia because uh, I've got no idea what they're going to do next year. Um, yeah, well, so uh, well, you know, have to wait another hundred years. Have to wait another hundred years before they get that 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 big uh, I, that boon. Well, I also did figure out once upon a time that uh, I'm not going to tell you how old I actually am, but I, I'll still be around for the hundredth anniversary of the Second uh, World War and. And I'll be pretty much in, in my prime as a historian yeah, at that right. point of uh, the Lawrence Friedman point, you yeah, know, when you right. actually stop teaching and doing administration, you just start pumping book after book out. Yeah, you'll so be, uh, I'll you'll be, be really emeritus by that it. stage, yeah, probably. Absolutely. <laughs> and uh, for any listeners who want to know how old Pete is, just uh, send me a message because I do know his age. Um, now, today we are discussing the American Caesar. Uh, General Douglas MacArthur. Now, of course, listeners, you all got that from my very accurate and not controversial at all intro. He's probably one of the most famous generals of the Second World War. Um, equally as famous, I think, as some of the other US generals that came out of the war and went on to uh, bigger uh, and better things. Uh, but are you able to tell us how this bloke, um, a bit of a narcissist, uh, but how he ended up commanding the Southwest Pacific forces? Absolutely. Well, I, I'd say he's a bit more than a bit of a narcissist. <laughs> um, you know, there's plenty of narcissistic uh, generals and academics out there. I might add, but uh, MacArthur would, would be in the top five, I think, of stakes of that in, in sort of all world history, even back from the ancient period, I think. Mac MacArthur was the commander of the US uh, and Filipino forces in the Philippines at the start of the Pacific War. He had retired, having uh, been chief of, the, of staff of the US Army and gone to the Philippines. Um, he, President Roosevelt had brought him back into full-time service um, and taken command of the ground forces in, in the Philippines. Yeah. It wasn't a very successful campaign in the Philippines. To give MacArthur a little bit of his due, the plan in the interwar period was never to actually hold and defend the Philippines if the Japanese struck, but to actually <laughs> concede that they would probably lose the Philippines. But through sheer willpower, personality and political connections, he tried to convince uh, the, the United States military to, to back his campaign, which was not very successful in the Philippines. Yeah. In fact, it was a complete disaster. Yeah, yeah. Um, his nickname amongst the, the, his soldiers was Dug Out Doug. Yeah. He did really inappropriate things like taking large uh, chunks of money as cash payments from the Philippine president just before the Philippines collapsed. But because he was an American icon and an American hero, and he was the one American commander at that stage in action with the enemy, the president decided that he would pull him out of the Philippines and order him back to Australia, where they were establishing a, a new theatre to fight yeah. the Japanese. The United States Joint Chiefs of Staff had command of the Pacific War writ large. Um, they really wanted to appoint a sole commander um, for that theatre. Yep. But the Navy, uh, who MacArthur didn't have a very good relationship with, wouldn't agree to it. Nimitz, <laughs> the new commander of the Pacific Fleet, was too junior. So they decided to split the theatre into the central Pacific Oceans area under, under the US Navy yep. and the Southwest Pacific area, which is the bulk of Australia, part of the South Pacific and part of what is now modern Indonesia. Yep. Um, into the Southwest Pacific, and he was brought back in March of 1942 to command that. Oh, he's a, uh, yeah, he's a. Uh, he, for those people that don't know, he ran away in the Philippines. That's and, probably uh, the best one, way to describe won it. Won the the Medal of Honor in in the process yeah, too, that's right. which the president and uh, and the chief of the U.S. Army, General Marshall at the time, did admit was done for more for morale reasons and propaganda reasons than MacArthur's performance. Yeah, I wonder who wrote him up for it. Uh, <laughs> if there's anyone out there um, who needs me to run away to get a Medal of Honor, just send me an email. Um, now, 
the command arrangement that MacArthur had, given that he was such an interesting character, but it was quite interesting for the time as well. Uh, and it, it may be a command arrangement that might not be too alien to uh, listeners who study modern coalitions. Um, but at the time, he was commander-in-chief of both US and the Australian Operational Forces, I think. Well, he's yes. at least advising the Prime Minister, John Curtin, uh, the Australian Prime Minister. He was his primary military advisor, not Australia's uh, most senior general. Um, so how did this interesting command arrangement even come about? Well, in the modern parlance, we would know this as a, as a joint theatre, and MacArthur was the joint commander. So yep. he was in command of Army, Navy and Air Force, and this, the service elements from both the United States, Australia, and of course the, the, the Netherlands at the time. There were yep. some, a very small number of, of Dutch um, military officials here. Most yeah. of them had been captured in the fall of, of Dutch East Indies. And of course, uh, the Dutch were occupied by the Germans. So in essence, it was really a, a coalition between Australia and the United States and the yeah. Southwest Pacific. Because he reported to the Joint Chiefs of um, Staff in the United States through General Marshall, uh, yep. the head of the, the, Australian, the US Army, he became the principal military advisor to the Australian Prime Minister. And in fact, in in a way, as David Horner and a few other historians have pointed out, Australia had to give up a sense of a level of sovereignty yeah. to this foreign general. Yeah. So a foreign general from a different country who we didn't have an alliance with and no really deep relationship at this time was made the principal military advisor to our government. And in fact, the way this worked in operation was um, Curtin along with the Secretary of Defence, Frederick Shedden, yep. and, uh, and Douglas MacArthur formed the Prime Minister's War Cabinet Committee. Yep. And they were the only three permanent members of it. There was uh, the Australian Commander-in-Chief, General Blamey, could be invited to those meetings, but he wasn't a standing <laughs> member of those, those. And, of course, the way MacArthur, in his megalomaniac type of way, he set it up that the Prime Minister could only go to him to have access to any of the other military commanders in the theatre. Blamey got around this because he was the Commander-in-Chief of the Australian Military Forces, so yep. he had a right to speak to the Prime Minister. But, for instance, the Australian Prime Minister couldn't talk to the, the um, Air Force component commander or the Navy component commander without going yeah. through MacArthur. Yeah, it's, it's very clever for MacArthur to set up that way. It makes it very, very, uh, very good for getting things done the way he wants them done. Now, I'm interested to know actually how this played out at the sharp end. And, you know, did the coalition forces work from operational planning right down to the tactical level? Um, were there any significant stresses or strains between the two nations providing the forces for the coalition? Uh, basically, did it work? Hmm. Uh, well, yes and no. <laughs> so yeah. it worked because in the end we, we win. Yeah. We win. We're successful. Um, Scoreboard. So there's a couple of really interesting factors that, that play into this. First of all is MacArthur's command philosophy. So he comes from the US Army at the time which has a very centralised process of command, a very top-down, as we would call it, process of command. There wasn't a lot of mission command, for instance, going on amongst the, the US military. Beyond that, and of course we know in, in doctrine, the yeah. personalities of individual commanders can make the best or worst of particular doctrines. And while the US doctrine was very centralised in its top-down approach, MacArthur was a megalomaniac and a control freak yeah. and everything you can think of like that. So he wanted to absolutely centralise everything under his command. So he set up general headquarters of the Southwest Pacific, which is his headquarters. Yep. Only US Army officers were basically allowed into it because MacArthur despised the US Navy. And of course, the Air Force was technically a part of the US Army at that stage. And he thought they were almost as useless as the, as the <laughs> US Navy. Then under him, he had a combatant commander. So a land forces commander under the Australian General Blamey. But of course, he wanted to command that himself. So he did everything in his power to, to nudge Blamey out of the way. Um, an Air Force commander who was eventually General Brett, uh, an American and a Navy commander, and he burnt through a fair few uh, for uh, Navy commanders in the, in the process as well. So there you have it divided up, which meant the way MacArthur operated, he would allocate single service task forces to do jobs, and then his commanders would have to cooperate, and he remained the sole joint commander. Mm -hmm. and it caused huge amounts of problems. On the Australian side, who were the bulk of his ground forces in the first couple of years, and a yeah. significant amount of his air force and naval assets, they came from a British philosophy that was a very um, inspired by the Western Front, which is about very mission command style in the notion that we would have it. Yeah. Now, as many of good um, British historians have pointed out, different commanders like Montgomery didn't necessarily follow that sort of philosophy and doctrine. Yeah. But the pure British doctrine was much more inspired by German ideas of staff structures and yeah. mission command. 
And we'd been trained by the Brits in their staff um, headquarters. We had continuity that we had one commander in chief blaming throughout the war. Yeah. And uh, we embodied that much more. So there was great tension <laughs> between a top down centralised British approach to operations and a bottom up decentralised approach from the Australians. And then you add a fair chunk of cultural imperialism in there. So yeah, the Americans okay. thought they were superior to everyone in the theatre. We thought, well, we'd been at war fighting the Germans for a while, so we, we thought, knew way more than the Americans did and, the, and who were way too academic. Yeah. And there was a lot of great tension. There was no really interoperability before the war. There was no joint planning, joint operations, hardly any liaison officers done before the war. All that common stuff we see with alliances today. And that's why I called the book MacArthur's Coalition. First of all, MacArthur dominates. Yep. And second of all, it's a coalition. It's a temporary ad hoc arrangement to fight a common enemy. Yep. And that's the basis of it. And that means you can't systematise this very well. We don't want to adopt US doctrine. They don't want to adopt our doctrine. Our force structures remain different. So it comes down to cooperating mainly on the basis of personalities and individual commanders. And you can imagine how difficult that is when you get two good commanders who want to cooperate, it works well. If you yep. get one who doesn't, not so well. And if you get two who hate each other, and many of them did, yeah. then it really is quite dysfunctional in parts. So and that's the story of, of the South Pacific. The, imp the primacy of personalities to try and overcome institutional problems and doctrinal problems and interoperability issues. So MacArthur, was it? He, I think it was his, uh, his Air Force component commander he removed fairly early on? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Kenny in charge? Yeah, General Brett. Um, Basically because the, the main reason is General Brett had been in theatre um, much longer than MacArthur. He was originally touted by the Australian government. They wrote to the US Chiefs of Staff and said, look, we happily have General Brett as the Commander-in-Chief. Yeah. So MacArthur arrives and sees a rival. Yeah. Sees that if he happens to miss a beat or fall over, Brett will stand up and replace him. Yeah. So he ostracises him. He actually, General Brett, he's his Air Force Commander, cannot get an appointment to see the Commander-in-Chief <laughs> at all. <laughs> and he has to work through um, General Sullivan, MacArthur's Chief of Staff, who's not a very popular officer, who has real issues and is a, almost as big a control freak as MacArthur. Yeah. So he's sidelined. And then when the, the first moment he can, MacArthur gets rid of him yeah. and bring General um, Kenny in, yeah. who I think personally is one of the best Allied Air Force commanders of the war, yeah. probably one of the best in the war full stop. He comes down to meet MacArthur. He's heard everything that's going on. He walks in and General Sutherland stops him and says, you can't go and see MacArthur without going through me. He walks basically straight past him into yeah. MacArthur's office and says, this guy out here is trying to stop me to see if I'm going to work for you, I'm working for you, and that should never happen again. MacArthur brings Sutherland in and says, you can't do that anymore. And that sort of <laughs> breaks the power of, of General <laughs> Sutherland in one go. And, and Kenny really realises you've got to play to MacArthur's ego. Yeah. You know, you've got to do a very, in modern parlance, Trump-esque thing of sitting around the cabinet room praising the Commander-in-Chief for all the things that he's wonderful and good at, yep. even though you know he's a flawed character, personality and whatever. So uh, Kenny figures that out and knows how to play MacArthur very well. Yeah. He's also very intelligent, a very good organiser and a great tactician and he does a wonderful job. Yeah, so it's interesting playing the man rather than the, uh, the ball uh, to get access to the ball, I suppose, is a way of thinking about it. That's the worst sports analogy I've had on this show so far. <laughs> um, as people know, I'm very good at sports ball. Uh, just before we go to the final question, though, I've got some unscripted questions in my mind, um, mainly because we're mates and I wanted to put you on the spot. But is there an operational example of the coalition at play, whether it's in the Papua campaign or the New Guinea campaign or just in the Southwest Pacific, just so our listeners can get an understanding of how the operations went in such a, I suppose, a, I won't say, I'll say troubled uh, coalition. Yeah. Look, I, I think a good example of this is a, is a little-known battle for the Battle for Salamara in 1943. Yep. It's argued that it's potentially one of the longest deception operations in the history of warfare. It starts in sort of January 1943 and doesn't end until sort of September, October of the same year. And yep. it's a masking operation. Um, basically, the Allied forces are pushing up towards Salamara in New Guinea on the hope to draw the bulk of the Japanese down from Ley. Yep. So when they're ready, they can launch a deliberate attack on Ley using an airborne... Um, landing, an air landing of a division and an amphibious assault to outflank this town. Yeah. In the lead up to it, um, they're struggling with the logistics side of things, they're deep in the jungle and MacArthur allocates a regiment of the US 42nd Infantry Division to mm -hmm. work under the Australians to make an amphibious landing, um, to open up a supply route, bring some guns in Mick, Excellent. lots and lots of guns to lots support, guns. The, you always support guns. the advance and also to, to, to get in the Japanese mind that yes, this is the main assault. 
So the commander of the 42nd Division hasn't really worked with the Australians yet. Uh, he's very culturally imperialistic and thinks he's vastly superior. But he does get along with the Australian Corps commander quite well and he does a deal with him. He said, yeah. you can have my regiment, you can give it to the Australian division over there, but it still will remain under my command. And then the Australian <laughs> Corps commander tells his Australian <laughs> divisional commander, yes, you can have this regiment, but it'll be under your command. So the poor American regimental commander lands his regiment um, um, in, into the operation through an amphibious assault and is finding that he's got two divisional headquarters to report to, <laughs> both of whom think they're in charge. And of course, the poor guy is, is being ordered to do one thing by one lot and ordered to do one thing by another. The Australian division commander eventually wants him sacked for being slow. But the reason he's being slow is the American divisional commander won't let him do things until all the plans and preparations are in place. Yeah. And this is caused by an Australian attempting to appease the Americans yeah. um, because of he's got a personal relationship with this commander. Yeah. He eventually, Herring agrees this is ridiculous, yeah. hands over the... the um, the regiment to the Australian divisional commander. And everyone thinks that's solved. There's a follow-up subsequent amphibious assault out of the same regiment. And there's a battalion in there commanded by a certain Major Roosevelt, yep. who is Teddy Roosevelt's youngest son oh. and a cousin of the President of the United States. <laughs> and he hates Australians. And he thinks we're completely <laughs> inept. He also doesn't even like his own commanders. So he runs off starting to do things and, and decides on his own fruition to write to the Australian division commander pointing out that he doesn't report to him that his real boss is his own division commander, that here's all the problems with the Australians, the Australian army and the way you're running your operations. And by the way, here's a letter I've sent to MacArthur pointing out basically that you're hopeless. <laughs> so this is the kind of milieu that's getting on. Meanwhile, down at the company, battalion level, diggers and doughboys or diggers and GIs gotta get along. They're yep. fighting a common enemy. And yep. what they do, the closer you are to the sharp end, the more and more there's cooperation between these two armies as they realise their lives depend on mutual cooperation. Yeah. So there's mainly American um, guns supporting Australian infantry and Australian guns supporting American infantry. The FOs figure out a way to do this, even though the systems are very different. Yeah. Um, you know, we send Australian soldiers out on patrols with the Americans to teach them because they're green and new how to patrol in the jungle. Yeah. We adapt some of the firepower plans from the artillery from the Americans who do that better than us. Yeah. So at the sharp end, that sort of is happening. It's based on personalities and getting to know you. Higher up the chain of command, you get these generals arguing over politics, over personalities, over resources, yeah. where you know this can happen a bit more. And of course, when they finally get cooperation, and it does sort out, um, McKechnie, the, the US regimental commander, is sacked, then later reinstalled because he can actually cooperate with people and get along. The campaign is a success in the end and the Australian Americans get along. But of course, the next phase of the operation, there's a different divisional commander for the Americans, a different divisional <laughs> commander, and this process sort of starts and goes over again. Where there's a bit of continuity is we do end up sorting out at the higher operational level. Yeah. So between the Allied Land Forces and General Headquarters, um, particularly amongst the Australian and US Navy, yeah. so the Seventh Fleet is very integrated and is a wonderful example of coalition integration. And the Air Forces get along pretty well uh, as well. So it, it varies where you are, but it yep. does come down to these personalities and these people working together. And the greater continuity you have at the higher command level and the staff level, the easier it, the easier it is to form a, a coalition. Because as I mentioned, it's not an alliance. We don't have established liaison mechanisms. We're not working off common doctrine. Yeah. You know, there's no ABCA agreement and framework mechanism yep. for the modern armies like we have today for us to all integrate into each other's systems. Yeah. So it's interesting, it's almost a precursor to the way we operate today in the... Uh, very much I'm sure that people have been uh, on modern operations uh, definitely agree that uh, the lower down it is, it's the easier it is to get along with your um, other nation partners yeah. and the higher up it gets. Uh, that's when more caveats start coming into place. It's that's, just no, the caveats are no longer whether or not the uh, commanding general is going to be running for president. Um, because these days they tend to involve themselves in a scandal as soon as they finish their tour and it rules them out of politics. We won't talk about that today. Now, Peter, each guest is asked to finish a sentence as the final question on the show. And we could sit here and talk about the American Caesar as much as we want. We could talk about it until the cows come home. Uh, and we're in the bush capital and there are literally cows wandering around. But the cows do look like kangaroos though. Um, the mission of the show is actually more related to a dead Prussian than a dead American. And uh, the mission is to discuss war, to define war, and continue this very important conversation and debate. So you've been on here before, so you can't just repeat what you've answered before. You can't repeat what you've heard before. Um, 
So now, after a pretty heavy lunch of some great Portuguese takeaway, I ask you to finish the sentence, war is. Is the hardest question on the show, I have to, to, to start with. <laughs> Well, I think well, I'll go with a, a classic cliche, war is hell. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> and, you know, if you think of some of these classic, and we're talking about the American Caesar, some of these classic American uh, generals, you've got, you know, Patton, you've got Eisenhower, and you've got MacArthur, and you've got, you know, and, and many others who fight throughout the, the course of the war. If, if you look at it from their perspective, war is hell. The, the destructive nature of what happens in the Second World War, the worst conflict in, in human history, the yeah. firebombing of cities, the dropping of the atomic bomb, but in a strange way, as we know, war is also an art, mm. it's a science, and in some elements it's a thing of beauty to some people. If we look at George Patton's approach to war, <laughs> yeah. he revelled in it. Yeah. He believed he was descendant from your know, warriors in the past. For some people it is, it is not just hell, but it is also a career. It is also, for some of them, something they enjoy, something that's a passion for some people, yeah. and something that they, uh, they learn to operate within. Mm. And I think I mentioned in the last uh, episode that it's an inherently human experience. Yeah. And so there's a broad range of human experience in there. We are, you know, uh, I've just been reading a, a wonderful book by Am Applebaum about the period after the war and the horrendous effects of the end of the war in, in Germany and Eastern Europe at, at that particular point in time. Mm. But for some other people, this is a way they've become rich. This yeah. is a way they've made careers, that they've become... Douglas MacArthur's and George S. Patton's, yeah. for them it's their profession. There's the full range of human endeavour involved in warfare. Yeah. From the worst of emotions and experiences, and I'd say for some people the best of emotions and experiences and everything in between. Yeah. yeah well, that's a, that's a very in-depth one. I thought you were just going to quote Sherman and go, but that's, <laughs> uh, that's good. I'm glad you didn't just quote Sherman and go because we haven't done any Civil War episodes and uh, uh, half my listeners are... Um, Probably not that well read, but you can be. If you log on to the thedebpression.com slash bookshelf, you can find some books there. Um, that's a good plug, but before I plug more of the uh, the things that keep the show alive, thank you very much for coming on the show, uh, especially now the big move uh, to WA, and uh, it's good My to pleasure. get a final lunch and chat in with you before you go. And also, listeners, uh, the book uh, will be coming out. So, Peter, thanks for being on the show. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Been a pleasure, as usual. Now, listeners, uh, if you click on the show notes in whatever... Uh, podcast app you've got or jump onto our episodes page on our website you'll find a link there to peter's book f through a book depository and just so you know you get free global shipping with book depository i know a lot of people use a lot of other book sellers but if you use the links we provide you not only does do you get free global shipping but we get a little bit of a kickback and it helps us pay for the fees for hosting and also for the equipment um, and you know every now and then i like to upgrade my equipment um, so Peter's book, A MacArthur's Coalition, will be out in March. I think it's around about the March 18th, um, but jump online. Pre-order it now. You can pre-order it can now. In fact, you can pre-order it now on uh, Book Depository. Uh, thank you for the iTunes reviews, listeners. Uh, they've been pretty good, except for that one person that left us one star and said there's too many mouth noises on the show. Talking is mouth noises, so I'm not sure what you mean. But for those listeners that don't enjoy the show, I do have a solution. Don't listen. But for those that do enjoy listening and want a little bit more, you can join the TDP community. And if you jump on our Patreon page, which you can find a link in the show notes, you can jump onto our members community where we have a forum where we can discuss each episode and a heap of other topics online in a closed environment, uh, Chatham House Rules. It's nice and friendly. A bit of banter goes on there, but that's only because people on there are smarter than me and I've got nothing else to do except tell lame jokes. We've also got a members blog where you can actually write something if you are a member and have your idea bandied around on the Deb Prussian website. You also get access to exclusive uh, once month content and for those that are uh, in the Legends Double Plus category, we do a monthly book club. And we've just finished the monthly book club with uh, Jack McCain's book on uh, Angola and Clausewitz and the American way of war and it was a cracker of a book club. All right, that's all I have for you listeners. So until next time, grab a book and crack on. Join the conversation with us on Twitter at Dead Prussian Pod, on Facebook at The Dead Prussian Page, or on our website www.thedeadprussian.com. All show notes for this episode, as well as copyright information, can be found on the website. The Dead Prussian Podcast is written, produced, and hosted by Mick Cook. It is co produced by Amanda Levito. The music used throughout is Caught in the Beat by Broke for Free and is used under a Creative Commons Attribution license. 
All opinions expressed by individuals on the podcast are those of the individual and not necessarily representative of any other organisation.